A couple weeks back, I asked on Twitter and on LinkedIn, what are the anti-patterns that you are seeing in your React apps that are causing problems on big React applications? And y'all came out and gave me all kinds of awesome feedback on the different anti-patterns that you're seeing in your React applications. So I took all of your suggestions and they were so good and I rolled them into this video and we're going to talk about the top five that you pointed out, talk about what they are and talk about how to avoid them. Let's get right into it. Number five is use effect. And so many of you pointed out use effect as a source for your woes. And I totally get it. So, well, what is use effect? Well, use effect is a React hook. And according to the documentation, use effect is a React hook that lets you synchronize a component with an external system, which seems incredibly vague. And well, what do we generally use it for? Well, most oftentimes it's used to do some sort of promise usually a fetch. You're going to go fetch some data from a remote system. And there are better ways to do that. And we'll get into that in just a second. But what ends up happening is you've got this dependency array and you get an infinite loop out of it because you have some state inside of that use effect that the use effect is then changing, but also depending on, and you can get a, a cycle. So it changes the state, the state then triggers that dependency array and you get a use, new use effect and it just cycles out of control. And this can happen with a single use effect where it depends on its own state, or it can happen with multiple use effects where the state of one is triggered by the second, which triggers the first, and you get into these nasty loops and it's a serious problem. Another thing that trips up folks about use effect is when strict mode is enabled in development mode, you, that use effect code gets called twice, which is, good in that it's trying to help you make sure that your use effects don't leak. On the other hand, it also is just kind of weird because you're getting different behavior in development mode versus production mode. A very common issue around use effect is when the dependency array includes an array or an object. Now, the way that React evaluates dependency arrays, it looks at the reference to the array or the object and compares that to the previous reference to that array or object. It's not looking at the contents of the array or the object. So you may have two objects where the data in them looks exactly the same, but still the effect is getting triggered. And why is that? Well, the memory locations of those objects are different. And for performance reasons, that's what React is looking at. It is short circuiting the comparison of those two objects or arrays by looking at the memory and comparing the memory addresses of those as opposed to comparing the contents. So never look at an array or an object in a dependency array and say, well, the contents of this are the same, therefore it should be triggering. That is not always the case. So what are some alternatives to using a use effect? Well, depends on what you're trying to do with it. If you're trying to go and compute some value based on some state, you actually don't need to use a use effect for that. You could use use memo and you can derive values from other values really simply. Or if that computation is simple enough, you just put it into the component code directly. It's not really a problem. Another thing you might be doing is having some complex interaction between various pieces of state and you probably would be better off using a use reducer, which allows you to create more complex state models than just use state. And then finally, if you're using use effect for something like doing a fetch, I strongly recommend going with something like React Query or SWR instead. Those are fantastic libraries that are much more powerful than hand coding fetches inside of use effect. They handle all the error cases. They handle retries and polling. They are fantastic libraries that are fantastic alternatives to hand rolling fetches inside of use effect. Number four is Redux. Lots of folks called out Redux as an issue. And I think, well, yeah, there's a little bit to do with Redux, but Largely, I think it has to do with large external stores. What I've seen in older applications is you have a React Redux application where you have a singleton store where every piece of state is in that store and it just gets wildly out of control. It's like having that junk drawer in your kitchen that everything just goes into. 
that is not a good recipe. And there's a couple of solves for this. First, Redux itself has evolved. There's now the Redux toolkit, and there are also slices. So you can actually slice up your state into various subsections of the store and organize it that way so not everything is in one giant junk drawer. Second thing you can do is just make local state local. We have use state, we have use reducer, we've got the entire bevy of hooks. You can go and take a state that's just local to a single component just make it local. There's no particular reason that you have to have everything in a global store. Another thing you can do is just use standard React context. If you've got slow moving state, like the user ID or dark mode, light mode toggle or the theme, just put that in context. There's no particular reason to go and put that in a store. A store is meant to give you hyper performance when you change pieces of the store where specific components update using selectors. You don't really need that when you have things like a user ID changing or the theme mode or the toggle of the dark mode, light mode. That's going to mean that your whole application is going to need to re-render anyway. So there's no particular reason not to use context for that. Another thing you can do is leverage everything that's in that Redux toolkit. Redux toolkit actually contains its own version of React Query or SWR. So you can use that instead of using other hooks. So just leverage everything that's in that Redux toolkit. And finally, alternative to having one mega store is to just break it up into much smaller stores and use a different technology. One in particular folks like to use is Tushdan. It makes it very easy to create small localized stores that are specifically focused on a single task. Number three is CSS. And by that, I mean having multiple standards for CSS inside of a single application. I've seen this a lot where you'll get some combination like Material UI and Tailwind together, which is a kind of odd combo. And a lot of your feedback was just don't do it. Find something and stick to it. So let's talk about some alternatives when it comes to CSS. One very popular alternative is to use a component library like Material or AntD. Those libraries have everything you need baked into it. You don't need to go outside of them. So just follow the rules of your component system that you've used. So if it's Material, then make sure to style your components and use all of their spacing and extra functionality that they've got baked into them. You don't need to go and bring Tailwind in on top of that. As much as I like Tailwind, you don't need to combine those two technologies. Another option is to use CSS modules. These are fantastic, particularly for things like Next.js. They're going to handle SSR. They're very performant. And if you are fluent in CSS, I would suggest actually just using CSS modules. Pretty easy stuff. Another alternative is to use Tailwind. Tailwind is a fantastic CSS utility library, and you can pair it with Shad CN. Shad CN brings in Tailwind for all of the styles, and then it sits on top of Radix for all the behavior, and it gives you a great component set that's really easy to use. And if you use something like Vercel's V0, it'll actually go and convert your design mockups into Shad CN with Tailwind underneath. Really good stuff. Finally, one last option for you is StyleX. It's a new CSS and JS library from Meta. That's what they use on Facebook right now. And if you've got a large application with a lot of developers and you've got a very clear component system that you want them to use, StyleX is the name of the game for that. It is a fantastic library and you should check it out. The big point here, and you pointed it out in what you said on Twitter and on LinkedIn, is that you should pick one and stick with it when it comes to CSS. The number two issue that you brought up was big components. To me, these are components really over 50 lines, but you all were talking about components in the hundreds of lines, 250, 300, 500 lines. That's crazy. Anything over 50 lines for me for a component is pushing it. And there's two reasons why you might have these kind of mega components. And the first is that the component is just ill-defined. It's trying to do too much. It's going to bring in too many props. It's trying to do too many things. And that tells me that you've got a factoring problem. You just need to take what's happening in that component and break it up into smaller components, each of which has a well-defined role. Another reason I see these big components are when folks define components 
inside of other components. This is really bad. This is not an anti-pattern that you should follow. It confuses React because you're creating a new component reference every time the parent is rendered. And that's going to really mess up the React rendering engine. It will work in some cases, but it is a time bomb inside of your application. Another reason that folks do this is so that they can share state between these components without using props or context. That is not the way to do this. Do not define components inside of other React components. And the number one thing that folks pointed out was too many libraries in your applications. I get it. When you're first starting out building applications, you're adding libraries left and right to go and try and get the functionality that you want. And that's fine. But at a certain point, as you have your application in a state where it's actually doing what you want, you got to spend the time to refactor it and look to make sure that every single library is doing its work. And then you should look at the types of libraries you're bringing in. Are you bringing in multiple state managers? You shouldn't do that. You should stick with a single state manager. When it comes to CSS, you should be looking and sticking with a single CSS system. So make sure that every library is unique and doing its full job. So once the application is in a steady state, just make sure that every time a PR comes in with a new library in the package JSON, make absolutely sure that you're getting your money's worth out of that library. A couple of tactical ideas for you in this space. First off, if you have a big bundle, use a bundle visualizer to go and see what is in that bundle, see where the big targets are, and then see if you can reduce the size of them. Another thing you can do is avoid barrel imports. That's where you've got a lot of exports out of a single index file. And then on the import side, you're just having a barrel around a whole bunch of stuff that you're bringing in. This has a tendency to give real problems to bundlers that want to do code splitting or tree pruning. And then finally, there's an excellent open source utility called NIP. You can add this to your test suite. It looks for unused imports and unused modules and is a fantastic thing that you should do on every single PR. It's not going to remove them for you, but at least it will error out in the test if you've got unused packages or unused local files. All right, well, thank you so much for all of the fantastic response that I got to my questions on both Twitter and LinkedIn. Let's get the conversation going in the comments. I've actually got enough for another one of these videos if that interests you as well. In the meantime, of course, if you like the video, hit that like button. If you really like the video, hit the subscribe button and click on that bell and you'll be notified the next time a new blue collar coder comes out.